Thank you very much, Judy, and good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, my fellow candidates, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out tonight as we celebrate that most basic right of Canadians, free speech. It is my privilege to be here tonight representing the Liberal Party of Canada in this place and time in Canadian electoral history. First of all, I congratulate my fellow candidates. Your commitment to the principles of our democracy and standing up for your beliefs is basic to our parliamentary system. David is a formidable opponent. But 11 years in Ottawa ought to be enough. <laughs> for all that, what a great night for democracy in Swift Current. This opportunity to debate ideas in a forum free from fear of reprisal is representative of what makes Canada the great bastion of democratic principles it is. Free speech is a cornerstone of democracy, and how fitting it is to be holding this debate on ground reserved for our First Nations people. Tonight's discussion will revolve around policy, and I will be talking about the Liberal platform. Character and leadership styles are issues in this campaign, and contrasts must be pointed out. For me, what makes this election, and the last, stand out in the history of Canadian elections is the approach to democracy of the governing party. Prior to the last election, this government proved its disdain for democratic principles in its approach to the wheat board, holding a barley plebiscite that only the most partisan could describe as fair. Shortly after the last election, in order to avoid certain defeat in the House of Commons, Stephen Harper prorogued Parliament. Now, Jim Flaherty, Minister of Finance, introduced his economic update, pretending that all was well within Canada, despite clear evidence of strengthening recession throughout the world. Mr. Harper's response had been that it was a good buying opportunity. To Conservatives, this passes as good fiscal management. Seeing the light, while Parliament was closed down, the Harper government introduced its plan to deal with the recession in Canada. Since it was the opposition parties that forced Mr. Harper to mend his ways, the credit that Stephen Harper claimed for getting Canada through the recession should go to them. Now that Mr. Harper is pretending that he knew all along what to do during the recession, it seems fair to blame him for the largest deficit in Canadian history, caused by incautious tax cuts and significant spending increases. So now it is our children who will be paying to restore fiscal balance to the federal coffers. We in Saskatchewan know from the 1980s that cutting taxes and increasing spending, sadly, is not the way to eliminate deficits. Jean Chrétien's Liberal government, government tackled the weighty Tory deficit and debt in the 90s, and it looks as though a Liberal government will also have to clean up this mess. Further tax cuts to large corporations when government debt is mounting make no sense, especially considering these tax, rate are all, tax rates are already 25% lower than similar rates in the U.S. But one prorogation wasn't enough for Stephen Harper. The constant bickering of the parties was starting to get to him. So when the tough questions being asked about Afghan detainees being tortured came before the House, he shut down Parliament again. It was a lot more fun for Stephen at the Winter Olympics chatting with Wayne Gretzky than facing the nasty opposition who wanted serious answers to serious questions. Well, for Stephen Harper, this is democracy in action. But for many Canadians, this contemptuous approach to Parliament reached its climax when, for the first time in the history of the Commonwealth, the government fell on a motion of contempt for Parliament. All opposition parties determined that spending estimates were incomplete and lowballed on untendered fighter jets worth 
15 billion, according to Stephen Harper, 30 billion to anybody else, and on building new mega prisons worth 10 to 13 billion. The Speaker of the House and the Parliamentary Budget Officer were in agreement. Even the U.S. equivalent to Kevin Page, Canada's uh, Parliamentary Budget Officer, wondered how Canada expected to buy the jets for less than the Americans. Well, then there's a long-form census. Stephen Harper is one person who would not like the facts to interfere with his opinions. By making the long-form census voluntary, the statistics cannot possibly be properly representative. And Harper wants four more years of this, but I refuse to spend my whole time talking about conservative shortcomings. After all, they were trying their hardest. <laughs> no, tonight is about looking forward. What kind of government do Canadians want over the next few years? We have seen the open way that Michael Ignatieff has answered questions from all comers at town hall meetings. And we have watched Mr. Harper's carefully staged events while he limits reporters' questions. Leadership is one of the most startling contrasts between the front runners in this election. The Harper platform presents the politics of fear. The liberal platform is based on the family. The liberal family pack is a five-point plan centered on families. The Canadian Learning Passport will help families pay for post-secondary education. The Early Childhood Learning and Care Program will create more high-quality, affordable daycare spaces. Our Family Care Program will help with the cost of caregiving. Our program to introduce stronger public pensions will enhance the Canada Pension Plan and provide help to low-income seniors. And our Green Innovation Tax Credit will help families save on energy costs and help the environment at the same time. We're blessed with more than two choices in this election. Though a vote for either the Green or NDP parties helps put Stephen Harper back into power. I have the utmost respect for both parties. The environment is an important matter that Canadians must face up to. But shouldn't your vote be based on more than one issue? And the NDP have helped to give Canada its social conscience. But the success of any social, socially beneficial program must be based on fiscal responsibility. The Liberal Party, with its big red tent, includes environmental awareness, actual help for families, and prudent economic management. There's one more issue that stands out in Cypress Hills grasslands and it has to do with David Anderson. His sense of right and wrong fails him occasionally. Along with every other Saskatchewan Tory MP, he was silent on the foreign takeover bid of Saskatchewan-based Potash Corp. He called Brad Wall a hypocrite for following the laws of Canada. His own campaign participated in the in-out scam of 2006 for which the coordinators of the scheme are facing criminal charges. He used Canadian Wheat Board voters lists in an attempt to influence directory elections. And he is parliamentary secretary for the Canadian Wheat Board, which is an organization he detests. He did not respond to the cries of his own constituents in the drought of 2005 to 2008. And I was there. I was hauling water to my cows, and I know what, what it was like. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time he answered for his failings. One minute left. The choice is clear. Conservative jails and jets, corporate tax cuts, and ongoing deficits are help for families. The politics of fear, or the politics of hope. The time has come to empower the voters of the Southwest. The time has come to rise up.